we are going to be talking today about, we're going to do our best up here, as a matter of fact, to solve the CIO paradox. The CIO's role, as we know, is always changing. It gets more complicated, it gets more challenging all the time. It is something that we are uh, personally are very fascinated with at CIO Magazine. And so we talk with hundreds of CIOs in the course of a year. We do a lot of research and surveys among CIOs. And we, and we do a number of events. And I find that when we get CIOs together, there are a lot of topics they're very interested in talking about. Cloud computing, the use of social media in the enterprise, showing business value to IT. But there's also a surefire topic that is always of great interest, and that is the future of the CIO role and all of the inherent contradictions that are actually built into this role. Businesses today require CIOs to help them grow strategically and yet CIOs also, while being innovators and strategic thinkers, also have to be very aware of risk management. They have to mitigate a lot of risks to the business. And they also have to make sure they're managing costs. In fact, the whole idea of doing more with less has become such a credo for CIOs that we, we simply hear it. It's, it's one of those table stakes, a given in the whole situation. And a lot of CIOs at many organizations inherent legacy applications and very inflexible IT infrastructures. And then the business folks tell them, well, go forth and innovate. So sometimes the way IT is structured actually works against innovation. And CIOs have to figure out those paradoxes, oftentimes on, on their own, which I think is why when we get CIOs together at events, they find this such an intriguing topic. It's just the chance to exchange ideas, which you'll hear a lot of up here today. Uh, is, is very appealing to everyone. Now, CIO Magazine began writing a column called The CIO Paradox a few months ago in January. And one of our longtime columnists and a friend, Martha Heller, writes the column each month and has been getting tremendous feedback from CIOs. She started out with a set of paradoxes, and we discovered that instead of four or five paradoxes, there were probably a dozen of them. And now she's having more and more interviews with people suggesting approaches and solutions and ways to address the paradox so that the profession can keep moving forward. So in one or early column that I'm, I'm very fond of and often use in these kind of talks, Martha identified a very handy framework for identifying and starting the discussion around the different aspects of the CIO paradox. And we're going to use that framework in our conversation up here today. It actually has four dimensions. Dimension number one is the paradoxes that are built into the role of the CIO itself. And that includes hire, being hired to be strategic and yet getting thrown down in the weeds of operational excellence, often immediately. Being a steward of risk mitigation and cost containment, yet being expected to innovate. A function that is seen as an enabler and yet is expected to be a business driver. So being an enabler implies a kind of service role, but yet being a driver certainly implies a different sort of role. So those are paradoxes just around the role itself. Then there are paradoxes presented by the stakeholders, the people that the CIO and the IT organization is responsible to. CIOs run one of the most pervasive, critical functions in the enterprise, yet we are always talking about proving our value to the business side. There are many, many successes that are invisible in IT, and yet the mistakes are very visible. In fact, you'll hear we have public sector CIOs up here, and, and they'll have a chance to tell you about how visible some of the, when, when Ann's organization has any kind of a glitch, it can be on the front page of the Boston Globe. So the stakeholders served by the CIO also, CIOs end up being very accountable for project success, and yet the business is often the one that has ownership. Then there's a third part of the framework about the IT organizations that CIOs run. Your staff, the IT staff, loves technology. They actually, they got into technology and engineering because that's what they love. Sometimes, a lot of them will tell you that they really like technology, but they're not so fond of people. And so one of the things they often have to do is influence and, and reach out and make friends with uh, the business side when in their secret heart of hearts they were hoping they would never have to deal with the end users. The uh, team members, so are your, your team members in your IT organization are often uncomfortable with people, but to succeed, we talk a lot about how important it is that they understand and have these connections in the business. 
Also, you develop inside your organization, you work on developing successors to the CIO role, but we found in our research that less than 10% of the time will an organization actually take the CIO up on who was the successor. They often go outside. And then finally, there is a paradox around the IT industry itself. Technology takes a huge, long time to implement. It's very complicated, but the tool set that you're using changes constantly. Technology is a long-term investment, but the company, your company, most of your companies think in terms of quarters. So it's very hard at the beginning of an ERP project, everybody is all on board. Year and a half, two years in, it's a little harder to remind everybody of why it was such a great idea. And then finally, your tools cost a fortune, but they have the highest defect rate of any product in any industry. So these are all things, and of course, the ones who have to solve all this are the CIOs. So let me tell you just a, a little bit about each of our panelists as we're going to discuss this. Seated down on the far end is Bill Brown. He is the, um, most recently the CIO of Iron Mountain, but actually just very recently transitioned into a role as Senior Vice President of Compliance, of Compliance Process at Iron Mountain. Bill joined Iron Mountain in September of 08, overseeing deployment of IT that serves critical business objectives. He, has, uh, he has had overall responsibility for core systems development, computing services, and service provisioning for Iron Mountain's customers which we were learning just before we came up here on stage, Iron Mountain has its hands on the physical documentation of 97% of the information in the Fortune 1000. That's the figure. Our jaws were all on the floor when we heard that one. So there's a lot of information being tracked at that company. Bill was recognized uh, this year as a Computer World Premier 100 IT leader. And as I mentioned, he's just transitioning to a new business role in compliance. And before he joined Iron Mountain in 2005, he had more than 25 years of management experience in IT, uh, IT operations, logistics, and electronic commerce. And then seated next to Bill is Ann Margulies. Ann is the CIO of the state of Massachusetts. Now, prior to becoming CIO for the Commonwealth, Ann was executive director of MIT's Open Courseware, the initiative to push teaching materials for most of the curriculum onto the internet. And she is a, uh, she calls, refers to herself as an accidental CIO who is in the job for two and a half years now, correct? Yeah. Largely because of a very persuasive governor who talked her into doing this. Because like many people who look at the CIO role from the outside, you look at the role and you think, who in their right mind wants to be a CIO? Um, <laughs> and uh, last year she was recognized as a finalist for CIO of the Year Award by the Massachusetts Technology Leadership Council, and this year was selected as one of the tw top 25 doers, dreamers, and drivers by government technology. Then seated next to her is James McGlennon. James is the Senior Vice President and Enterprise CIO at Liberty Mutual Group. He is responsible for all aspects of IT, including applications, infrastructure, on which Liberty's business units are processing more than $30 billion in revenue annually. Before he joined Liberty in 2007, he spent seven years with Bell South in Atlanta in positions such as VP of Architecture and Development and VP and CIO for Customer Markets. He's also held senior IT roles with Fleet Financial and Computer Sciences Corp, and he began his career with Digital Equipment Corporation, where he worked in both the US and in Europe. And then last but not least, we have the recently retired CIO of the Department of Energy, Tom Pike. Tom has served his country as an expert in computer systems for more than three decades. He began his work at what is now the National Institute of Standards and Technology, otherwise known as NIST, before moving on to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, where he was that agency's first CIO ever. He built a 30-year career with the US Department of Commerce, making major improvements to the organization's IT security posture and managing a $2.1 billion IT budget. Five years ago, he was brought into the US DOE to beef up its defenses against IT security threats after a series of embarrassing lapses in the face of such threats. He retired in February, but from the sounds of our conversations has really barely slowed down. So these are the folks who are going to help us solve the CIO paradox. And I will start out by quoting something Bill Brown said to me about this. He said, well, the life of the CIO is the paradox itself, which actually, uh, the, there's a lot to that. Well, let's, we'll start out by talking about that first piece of the puzzle, the role itself. 
Um, and, and Bill, I will pick on you first because you have, you have come at the role at Iron Mountain, and we talked about this, about that balance between being strategic and being very operationally focused. How, has, how did the paradox for you work out at Iron Mountain? What were some of the things you noticed about it? So thanks, Mary Fran. I think the biggest um, aspect of the paradox is the wide swings between the need for strategic and the need to be tactical. Uh, IBM just came out with the 2009 year of the um, CIO, or the voice of the CIO, and they talk about the difference between an innovative, uh, inspiring innovator and an able pragmatist, right? And, you, and there's these tremendous swings between we want to be innovation, show our customers how to use their information, and by the way, did you know that the video conferencing had some interference this morning? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the real key, is to be able to balance both of those worlds uh, and, and be able to deliver in both areas. I, I was happening to catch up on some reading this morning uh, on the way in on my commute, and uh, Michael Frydenberg, it was in this May's CIO magazine, mm -hmm. um, one, of, one of the lines was, no longer is it far-fetched to think that our world will eventually enjoy unlimited bandwidth, billions of smartphones, applications from all corners of the cloud, and ubiquitous social media connections. And I'm saying to myself, wow, I'm so glad I'm picking compliance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the CIO job, you're thinking, I got to get the hell out of here. <laughs> now, um, James, at, uh, at Liberty Mutual, one of the things we talked about was the cultural change that you worked on in, in when we were discussing this part of the paradox, that operational focus, the head down kind of SLA focus versus having more of a connection on the business side. How has that played out in, in the time you've been with Liberty Mutual for three years? but um, just recently took up the CIO role. Well, thanks, Mary Fran. You know, um, I'm not sure it's a paradox, but I think it continues to be a balancing act trying to be mm -hmm. a CIO today. And um, sometimes I think that um, IT has been its own worst enemy in some of the things that we've uh, thrust on ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we've taken what would on the surface appear to be good ideas, like things like ITIL and these type of um, yeah. mechanisms and made them into um, you know, the Bibles of how we do our work. And over the years, I think um, that has led to, uh, at least in, in our organization, frustration within the teams mm -hmm. that we've worked on to try to get back a culture of accountability and responsibility where people do the right thing um, and understand the process improvements and take responsibility for that, but at the same time also take ownership for uh, the outcomes. So I don't know if it's a direct answer to your question, but there are a lot of dimensions that, that uh, make up uh, you know, how, you, how you are successful in working with the business teams and your end customers. And for me and for our team, I think we've kind of settled on the fact that it's um, the right mixture of accountability, responsibility, education, mm -hmm. which I think is a huge part of it, and um, taking you know, ownership of, of uh, what the outcomes are for the things we do. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's a... Okay, great. Well, and th that uh, is very reminiscent, Anne, of some of the things that we talked about as you came into the role of CIO of Massachusetts. Uh, you are, have a very huge budget, enormous scope, uh, but also are facing 30% cuts. There's a lot of the global recession that has affected private business over the last few years that has finally landed on government this year in a very big way. So when you think about the, those paradoxes in the role itself, that strategic versus tactical focus, how have you gone about balancing that for yourself in the CIO role? And, and explain why uh, the accidental CIO. <laughs> Uh, accidental CIO, because I never set out to be a, a CIO, and yeah. I don't have a typical background. In fact, when someone did explain to me that CIO stands for career is over, I decided <laughs> I definitely didn't want to go that direction. But I keep ending up back um, back as a, as a CIO. And I come from a background uh, where I've always been um, just more business focused and uh, less focused on the technology, more focused on the people part. You know, essentially mm -hmm. CIOs are in the people business. Yeah. Um, you know, the balancing of the strategic and operational aspects of a CIO is 
difficult, but I, I think the reason that we have to do it is because the CIO role has evolved. Mm -hmm. In a sense, uh, we're a victim of our own success. It's because we've sort of arrived at that sea level. And I really think it is the same as others in the chief or the, in the C-suite, as they like to say, often have to balance the short term with the long term. Yeah. I think when it comes to CIOs, in order to have the right balance, you absolutely have to have solid operations first. Mm -hmm. If you don't have industrial strength, solid operations, if you end up with a very bad story at the top of the fold yeah. on the Boston Globe because of a system crash, you're not really going to be able to have much input on any kind of strategic issue yeah. in the government. Yes, the operational excellence piece is always the table stakes, as, and we all talked about that. That's you know that literally is the first step you have to get done. In fact, a, a lot of the the research CIO magazine has done on the different parts of the role. There's a at the top of the pyramid for CIOs is a business strategist kind of role, and then the next row down is the transformation turnaround specialist. Because a great number of CIOs actually get hired in to clean up problems from the last CIO who got fired. And so, and then there is the functional CIO. That's probably the safest role because getting the technology and the operational excellence piece of it is actually more doable than some of the strategic stuff. And I see you grinning away over here, Tom. What are you thinking of? I'm thinking of the CIO as an opportunity leader. Yes. And yes, we have a balancing act. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, we have to be careful about the things above the fold and, and, and below the fold. Uh, 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 in the case of the Department of Energy, even if it's on a local paper in, in, in Los Alamos, which is uh, where one of our labs is that over, over the years has, has tended to have some, some issues, including some cybersecurity issues that get a lot of attention in the media. Mm -hmm. We're in the balancing business. We have a lot of things to keep track of, but I think it's very important that we take a, a, a high road and that we take a strategic view of our jobs. Uh, I was a CIO in the federal government for over 10 years since, since we discovered that the private sector had CIOs, so maybe the federal government should follow the private sector model. We should learn from the private sector and, and, and apply, apply this model, uh, including the model of having the CIO report to the top leadership. Mm -hmm. and, and what I found is that I could be more, most effective by being a partner with the CEO, the COO, and with the business unit managers. In the federal government, we call them undersecretaries, at least in the Department of Energy. And even though it's a highly federated organization mm -hmm. where everybody thinks for themselves and everybody has, uh, has smartphones in their pockets, and, and, and just like all of you all do here, uh, uh, it's a partnership process. And I viewed my role in part as being a cheerleader for the smart application of information technology to get the job done better. Mm -hmm. And have to keep the sights on the strategic goal and bring in really good people to help keep the operations going. Understand you can never give up that responsibility mm -hmm. in case something goes sour. Mm -hmm. But you have to move forward and stay on the high road to the maximum extent possible. Yes. Well, and, and if that works, then instead of CIO standing for career is over, it can actually stand for career is opportunity. And that's one of those little, those little twists we've been trying to make on it, because we've heard that career is over thing before. It depresses our readers. We don't like to focus on it very much. Sorry I brought it up. No, that's OK. Um, and I wanted actually something you said, Tom, was reminding me, James, about um, our discussion around moving the CIO role from order taker to enabler of the business. In fact, the enablement word came up in my conversations with all of you. Uh, talk a little bit about how you have been constructing that path from order taker to enabler at Liberty. Sure. Um, I think that we've talked a little bit about it already, that in order to be able to talk about the strategy and how you help formulate the strategy, you must be able to execute. That's the table stakes, as, as we've talked about. And um, once you can convince your business partners and you know the CEO or whoever it needs to be that you, you can get that under control and working effectively, then they're in a position where they feel much more amenable to your, your input and, and, and will listen to the ideas you have. Mm -hmm. in, in our case, um, we, we've uh, grown through acquisition significantly over the last couple of years, and um, we've had a lot of tough decisions to make. So oftentimes, 
the decisions with the, between the business and technology uh, sides of the equation have ended up being let's make sure we're m making the right long-term decision mm -hmm. and understand the, the pain and the steps involved in order to get from where we are right now to, to, uh, to, the, um, to the outcome we want to achieve. But um, I think in our business, the business team, whereas they may not understand every nut and bolt of the, of the technology, they certainly understand the fact that we don't make gadgets and widgets and we're not manufacturing anything. And our business is about information and, and about our ability to use it effectively internally to optimize our processes, but also to um, generate new products and new ideas that we can engage our, our constituent customers, if you like. And they, in our case, there are end customers, the people we insure, the uh, 15,000 independent agents we sell insurance through, and also our, our employees who um, use our technology um, in every facet to, to serve our customers' needs. So it's, 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 again, about proving your ability to execute, coming to the table with practical ideas that you can implement, that you're pretty confident about the outcomes. You know, the way I, it's not the Jetsons view of where we want to be in 10, 20 years from now. I think it's really important that uh, IT and the CIO and all of our leaders in IT are able to articulate what we're going to do in the next two to three years. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of us don't actually know what's going to be beyond two to three years. And uh, you have to be able to execute and deliver capabilities within that time mm -hmm. and um, be able to answer the so what about technology, which is a key thing for us. So we talk about all these clouds and networks and virtualization and all these, you know, the, the buzzwords of today, right? The business team members are looking at us going, so what? Why do I care about that? And our job is to be able to educate them in uh, terms they understand, because that's what gets buy-in. That's what gets them to pony up the money to say, OK, go and invest in this idea. I understand why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I saw you nodding at that, Anne. You did actually uh, quite a bit of restructuring with the, the change into the eight levels, of the, the different secretaries, and how IT did. Explain that a little bit about how, because that was very key to starting that, that move up toward a more strategic focus with IT, was getting everyone aligned under those eight secretaries. Yeah, well, it, it did all start with the need to have a vision and a strategic plan. Mm -hmm. So in the not-for-profit not world, and certainly in the government world, uh, we're mission-driven. And uh, at least here at the Commonwealth, there hadn't been a strategic plan for information technology since 2003. So when the governor was elected, he recognized, uh, based on a report from a transition team, that there had been dramatic underinvestment in the information technology infrastructure, just as there had been in the more obvious roads and bridges. So he knew it was going to be important for us to make some very important, very long-term, very strategic investments in technology so that government can do what government needs to do, which is to better serve the citizens and the, and the businesses of the state. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first thing we did is create a strategic plan and very rapidly got leaders from across the Commonwealth together. And uh, we assessed where we were today with a massively complex, non-standard technology environment that had become, over time, just impossible to try to get to work together. It became, has become too expensive for us to maintain and really, really difficult for us to secure all the incredibly important data that we hold on behalf of citizens and businesses. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this group came to very quick and very clear consensus that we needed to consolidate across the executive branch. And this was before there was an economic meltdown. So this was not about cutting costs. It was not about laying off people. It was uh, similar to some of what the other panelists mentioned this morning recognizing that for us to be able to innovate, we first had to standardize. It's that counterintuitive concept, yes. which is we have to build an industrial strength standard infrastructure in order to innovate on top of it. Mm -hmm. But it's not all about the technology. It's about the workforce, too. And just as the technology had been massively decentralized and complex, it's because reporting to the governor 
our eight secretaries, reporting to the eight secretaries are about 100 agencies. And each agency had its own IT operation. So there's 100 different IT organizations. That's what really creates this patchwork I refer to. Mm -hmm. So in order to consolidate, you can't just lift and shift all the technology in the boxes. We have to also consolidate the people part, of course, the harder part. And so we're in the process, process now of consolidating 100 IT agencies, uh, IT groups and agencies into eight secretariat level mm -hmm. IT groups. So that's incredibly important to simplify and consolidate, but at the same time, we're raising the level of IT in government. So government tends to lag business um, and I think is still in the process of getting to view technology as strategically as it should. But through this consolidation and this restructuring, we're not only streamlining and simplifying, but we're also creating a higher level of strategic IT leadership across across right. the Commonwealth. Right. It, it, it is. It's a very impressive approach for restructuring that much complexity. Um, and it actually reminded me of, of something that, Bill, you, we talked about. We kept the word evangelized, kept coming up as a verb. In fact, I think I heard that from all of you, the idea of not just evangelizing IT value to the business side, but actually evangelizing the idea of attacking business process first and then thinking process first and technology second. And I'm seeing nods of recognition on that. Bill, talk a little bit about how you did that at Iron Mountain, because that was something that you undertook early in your CIO role there. Yeah, there were two areas of enablement. And the, the first one, really, I think, that uh, preceded business process orientation was around helping uh, the business leaders to navigate their insatiable appetite for projects, right? So as CIOs in the audience, we're all you know, front row seats to this, uh, this sea of new projects. And what we help people understand, help the business understand, that first of all, the death knell of a project is to have IT own it. So let's make sure we put the ownership back on the business and help them navigate through a business value discussion how those cream of the crop projects should bubble up and get the, get the IT teams and the operational teams focused on a more narrow set of high value initiatives. But along the way, to really understand that preceding that IT enablement of those projects really requires uh, an inspection of the business process. And uh, you know, all you do uh, when you automate a bad process is just make it go bad faster. So we started putting the hands back into the, uh, the business. We actually hired a business process improvement executive to come help build this capability and to look at the 15 or so major business processes that we have at Iron Mountain and to start looking at ways to optimize and remove defects, accelerate processes prior to bringing them to, to the technology table, at which time then we can help automate a very honed uh, and, and you know, uh, really tuned process. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, and, and uh, Tom, as I, so you're nodding along to that, and we had talked a little bit about, uh, since we're into the stakeholder part of our paradox here, managing all those different stakeholders in the federal government is, I think of it as even more complex than in the state government, because you've also got Congress involved. We, Nobody likes to involve Congress. Um, and talk a little bit about how you manage that at the Department of Energy. In the federal government, there are a lot of stakeholders, yeah. and they come in different flavors. Uh, the most important stakeholders, you could say, are the customers, the folks who receive the information and other products mm -hmm. that the federal agency, in this case the Department of Energy, uh, including all of the national laboratories that are part of the Department of Energy complex, all the products that we put out, and finding better ways to put out better products and to deliver them in a, in a more useful and productive way to, to the customers. So the customers come first. Okay. Second, we have, from a CIO standpoint, the very top leadership, the secretary in this case, CIO, the CEO, uh, and the expectations that the, that the very top leadership of the organization has. Third, there are government-wide constraints. Um, you use the word compliance, especially associated with your new job. Um, uh, there are folks in central positions in, in the federal government who think compliance is the way we should manage agencies and help them do the right thing. And uh, that's well intended, but in fact, it can get in the way of innovation and can get in the way of, of doing the right thing. I heard those words earlier. And, uh, 
then we also have the, the stakeholders who are the members of Congress, the senators and the, and the, and, and the uh, members of the House of Representatives. Uh, and they definitely have an ownership on behalf of the American people, and they have an oversight role, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they frequently exercise it. Uh, sometimes in a way that's uh, helpful to us, sometimes in a way that makes life more challenging. Uh, when, when I came on board to the Department of Energy, as you mentioned earlier, Mary Fran, uh, the department had, had suffered some cybersecurity attacks yep. uh, from the outside, uh, from uh, 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 very sophisticated attacks that, uh, that resulted in, in the movement of some information out, outside, um, outside the, the department and outside the country even. And, and this became uh, uh, above the fold type information, uh, type, mm -hmm. type report. Uh, also, we had our own red team, internal red teaming, and we, the department still has red, uh, internal red teaming that had identified some, some uh, 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 frailties of the infrastructure that, that shouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. When you put the two of those together, it called for a revitalization of the department's cybersecurity program, which I led over these last several years, and the department is now adequately protected, I would never say well protected, adequately protected for the kinds of threats that we are currently facing and expect to face in the near future, but the threats are getting worse. There are more and more attacks. The attacks, uh, especially the high-end ones, tend to be more and more sophisticated. Perhaps many of you are experiencing this, and we need to continue to be aware and alert. So it calls for the CIO to play a balancing role Mm -hmm. between moving out with information technology, including the use of cloud computing, social networking, while at the same time giving adequate attention to risk mitigation. Mm -hmm. And that includes mitigating the risks against incidental or accidental uh, 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 happenings, things that just go wrong, uh, uh, as well as intentional, whether they be cyber attacks from the outside or intentional acts uh, by folks internally that uh, um, are maliciously uh, motivated for whatever reason. So um, uh, the, all aspects of risk mitigation that relate to IT and to information, in my mind, are in the province of the, of the CIO, and we, we need to be very careful to balance putting protections in place against the interference that certain kinds of protection uh, creates to enabling the mission and to serving customers. Well, and of course, overarching on all of this, especially as we talk about serving customers, is a real huge need for communication. A lot of communication about what's going on in the organization, even communication inside of it. And James, I'm thinking of the conversation we had about your use of collaboration tools and some of the internal work that you've done uh, at Liberty Mutual. How has that helped improve uh, the communication flow inside the IT organization? And then what parts of it actually have also moved over into the business? Well, over the last couple of years in particular, as we acquired and, and worked to integrate um, the companies that, that we acquired, a, a big part of it was indeed about collaboration and trying to help people understand the values that we have, the goals that we have, the aspirations that we have as a company, and more importantly, our strategies and tactics mm -hmm. that we're going to use to, to, uh, to get there. Um, because we have a fairly diverse, you know, we've got 40,000 employees um, in the U.S. and, you know, nearly 4,000 of those are technology employees and they're distributed all over the country, it's critical that we understand how we engage the teams on a variety of different levels. So I spend quite a bit of my time making sure that I get out in front of the, the individual groups to help them understand the business strategy and how our technology strategy underpins that. Yeah, I think you and, mentioned you've done goals. like six town hall meetings in a three week period, each with like 600 people in them. Yeah, usually yeah. In, in the spring and the fall, I try to get out and say, okay, here's what we're trying to get done, here's how we're gonna go about it, and then go back later in the year to say, here's what's working, here's what we need to continue to fine tune. Mm -hmm. Recently, um, we've also placed a lot of emphasis on a couple of themes. One, one is um, the collaboration theme, so we've built out some knowledge management capabilities, which simply set our sets of, sets of technologies, whether it's wikis or SharePoints or discussion theory, you know, mm -hmm. forums or whatever it is, where we get people to participate in virtual communities on a variety of subjects. And this is not a new concept, I can assure you. I mean, a lot of people think it is, but it's been out there for decades. And you know, I remember when I started my career at Digital Equipment Corporation, there were lots of, 
ways that people could participate in virtual communities. Yeah. The tools are better today, mm -hmm. and it's a more immersive experience in terms of the, you know, the multimedia and so forth. But you still have to figure out how you get over the inertia and get people to believe that it's not just an extra thing they have to do in the day. Mm -hmm. That's tough. Mm -hmm. So there's an inflection point where you finally get to the point where you say, OK, it's worth my while contributing 30 minutes of my day to be a participant in this virtual community because I'm hopeful that I'm going to figure something out that takes away six hours that I would have otherwise spent solving a problem or figuring out something mm -hmm. that somebody else has already figured out. So that's been a huge emphasis for us in terms of um, one aspect of how we communicate. So we obviously take you know, many different approaches to how we communicate across the teams, everything from you know, in-person in meetings to virtual communities to emails and, and whatever. We're deploying a fairly sophisticated video infrastructure right now that will enable us to have um, um, the equivalent of an internal YouTube structure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, the interesting thing about that is that we don't really know yet exactly how that will be adopted and how people will think of new ways to embed video communications into the fabric of our communications, but we certainly want to be able to enable that. Yes. And um, so I think we're well positioned to do that, and that's a critical part of, uh, of, of you know, realizing the overall power of, of, of the team and um, making sure that people understand what we're trying to achieve, how we're going about it, and engaging them in um, also in formulating the strategy of the things we should do in IT, not yep. just kind of, you know, here's here are the, the marching, marching orders, orders here's yeah. your project list, and you know, whatever. Yeah. We're really trying to get people to understand that you, know, you can contribute to this at, um, on a variety of levels and, mm -hmm. and you know, be a subject matter expert. And you know, it doesn't have to mirror the hierarchy of our, of our organization, mm -hmm. and often does not. And um, you know, we're trying to inspire people to do these things in coaching and mentoring models across the team. Yes. Yep. So, um, with some success so far, but we have a, a long way to go, but um, it's, it's, it's on the right track. Well, we've noticed in our, uh, we do an annual, the CIO 100 awards are all for innovation and, and business value delivery, and we've noticed a rising number of awards now are being given for uh, clever things with desktop video and, uh, you know, internal Facebook's build that then led to mm -hmm. some wonderful idea that became a revenue driver on the business side. You know, that idea of, of uh, Bill, I think you called it getting your eyes up off the horizon you know the we talked about IT myopia yeah I mean you know we're, we're all trained uh, you know from our you know uh, where we came from to kind of get in and, you know write code and, and eyes down and I think the, the, the real inertia is to to fight that and really keep your eyes up and and I think um, you know social media are in those areas and we heard this morning in terms of talent management from the academic panel just you know if you think about the people that are coming into the workforce today mm -hmm. um, they have no tolerance for for email, I mean, email to them is just some, you know it's an it's an impediment. You know, it's they want something wanna... you send to old people. Somebody right. told me one. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the um, <laughs> it is, and in fact, uh, James, as you were talking about that idea about getting people uh, involved as we bring as more twenty-somethings and Gen Ys or millennials come into the workplace, that idea of checking around with their own little network to solve a problem is much more natural because of all the connectedness uh, of how they are you know, approaching, approaching life. Um, do you have, on the federal or state government, are you seeing a good influx of younger talent, or has that not been a place that you've been able to get to yet because of hiring constraints? We've um, obviously not been hiring uh, <laughs> at the state, um, having gone through truly in the last two years 30% budget cuts, mm -hmm. but uh, three years ago, when the governor asked me, what are you worried about now that you've been here just a, a few months, mm -hmm. um, I did say the workforce, because it was clearly uh, just as is happening everywhere um, in the state with uh, baby boomers aging out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. We had the possibility of 50% of our 2,000 mm -hmm. IT workers retiring in the next five years. Mm -hmm. So the, the silver tsunami seemed very, very real. And um, I'm very concerned because at the state, of course, we can't pay competitively with some of the businesses that uh, we're vying for talent. And so I'm very worried about creating a pipeline of talent 
into state IT jobs. Mm -hmm. And I have to give all credit to the governor because he said, well, we have a university system. Have you talked to them? So it seemed brilliant. And in, we're now working with UMass Boston and their computer science program. And they've developed with us, again, it's something that the business sector, I think, has done very effectively. But we're taking interns in from computer science departments at UMass and uh, having them come from the summer and having them come over the um, holidays. Mm -hmm. And I think now we've created quite a pool of people who are really eager to work at the state because you get exposed to more technology and more responsibility early on in your career than you can, I think, often in the public sector. And it, I think at least what I'm telling all the students, because I truly believe this, mm -hmm. is it can be a real launching pad to technology right. jobs. Well, and, and that, that point about having much broader responsibility than they would in a much bigger corporation is so true. And mm -hmm. they will see that play out. And is there a similar situation at the federal level? At the federal level, we've seen a lot of new folks, including the younger folks, both mm -hmm. real younger folks and young at heart folks, uh, come in with the change of administrations a year ago, okay. as well as as well as well with the normal influx of, of new folks in the programs and, mm -hmm. and in the IT operations and IT activities. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I had to laugh for a moment when you, when you said that email is intended for old folks, because yesterday evening uh, I, I was looking at a text that I had just received, and I responded to it. And somebody next to me asked, said, do you text often? I said, yeah, quite a bit during the day. <laughs> and you know, um, almost as much as I do email, although I get a lot more emails than I do text. Yeah. Uh, but but th there's a new set of expectations with the, with, the, with the newer, younger folks. And in the case of the Department of Energy, our, our Nobel Prize winning uh, Secretary of Energy, Steve Chu, whose uh, 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 expectations as a laboratory director, a scientific laboratory director, mm -hmm. are, are high. And I mean, he's never without his laptop, his, his iPhone, his Blackberry, and everything else all, all together. But I found people who were willing to roll with us, and we, there is the beginning of using virtual world technology for, for training and for communicating with customers. Uh, Facebook, from the very beginning, we, we put the, the boss's uh, Facebook page up, and it's become an integral part of the way uh, communication is done with customers. Uh, all video is now done using YouTube, not just the internal YouTube, but using YouTube itself and other social networking capabilities found a great willingness and interest and in fact an expectation of these news people mm -hmm. to have this technology readily available. So to maintain the credibility of IT operations and IT support, uh, we had to start out, uh, not that we didn't continually keep up with or in some cases ahead of new, new technology, continue to get a head start and then roll with it and make sure that uh, we were the voice and encourager and cheerleader for new technology and there to help and respond and in fact be proactive in the process. Well, you know, and, and I would love you to share the anecdote with the crowd here about your experience with Al Gore. This was back before he inter in invented the internet. Um, he was uh, managing an international program and you, in your role as an activist CIO, uh, did some work with him to convince him that the internet wasn't too dangerous or too complex for school children. Yeah, well, that was an interesting time. Uh, I, I was very fortunate to, throughout my career to have a, quite a number of different jobs for four to six to eight years at a time. Uh, uh, I, would, I, I started out at, at NIST, developing standards, IT, leading research. Uh, I went to National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, where I led the, as assistant administrator, led the weather satellite program, nation's weather satellite program, and uh, the safekeeping of all the, the nation's environmental data. And as an outgrowth from that, before I became a CIO, actually, uh, I was asked to, uh, to go over and help this new vice president, Vice President Al Gore, who had a smart idea for a new international science and education program for kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is an environmental science and education program, which is called the GLOBE program, Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment. It's now in 23,000 schools in 112 countries and going strong. 
with a new inf infusion of funding even for this fiscal year, thanks to the, that Congress I, I gleefully uh, mentioned there earlier. That must have been quite a good so, demo so, you did so, with Al. So I, mean, so it, it, I, I started out with put, out. put together a team, had a big leadership team, spent a lot of personal time, it was very exciting with the Vice President and with the leaders of a good many other countries as we, as we put this all together on a partnership basis. And uh, very, very early on, I decided that it made sense to use the internet for the kids to collect their environmental data, take their measurements, share the data with each other and with professional scientists, not that they aren't professional as well, and to, and to be the supporting uh, infrastructure for the program. And so I wanted to put the internet in schools, not just across this country, but around the world. And, and the boss uh, had some concerns. Mm -hmm. He was concerned that kids, it was hard to use felt it hard, was hard to use, and kids might th see things they, they shouldn't see. Mm -hmm. And so I brought in the president's science advisor, former head of, of DARPA, and, and, and quite a number of other people, and collectively we convinced him that, yes, indeed, we should use the internet. Now, that was in the time frame before we had the web as we know it today. And, and I didn't just want to use the internet. For a variety of reasons, I wanted to use what was then Mosaic. Didn't have Netscape or anything beyond that, didn't have Internet Explorer. Uh, I wanted to use Mosaic, in part because from a system standpoint, there was already enough of an infrastructure that had come out of the University of Illinois mm -hmm. that we could use their client software for Macs and PCs in schools, people can take their choice, and for servers, and concentrate on the applications. Sounds like mm -hmm. middleware, doesn't it? And so, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in addition to have a, you know, a rather attractive interface to work with, mm -hmm. um, and I chose at that time not to tell him that we were going to do that. And, uh, and the next spring when we demonstrated it on a big celebration on Earth Day, yeah. uh, the program was shown in its full glory and he came to a full appreciation. Uh, two years later, President Clinton and Vice President Gore out at the Exploratorium in San Francisco had, had our kids, our Globe kids, demonstrate what they could do if they had the internet in their school mm -hmm. and, and, and how this enabled them and using IT to enable them to be to, to learn science better through hands-on hands -on, hands -on application. And, and that was when the president went out and announced that by the year 2000, we were going to put the internet in every, every classroom school. in the United States. Uh -huh. We pretty well met that goal. So it became a, a catalyst for that action. I and like yes, that. indeed, uh, so far as I know, uh, uh, Vice President Gore uh, did in some sense invent the internet, as, as he is said to have claimed. <laughs> Now that sounds like a political statement. At the no, that's not a political yeah, statement. Well. That, that was just that's just being being kind to him. He did, mm -hmm. as Senator, uh, yep. uh, create legislation called the High Performance Computing Act. I see at least one gentleman out in the audience who probably has mm -hmm. a larger claim to having participated in developing the internet. Though. Well, it uh, <laughs> there's probably a whole bunch of people in this room that, <laughs> that can lay claim to that. As a matter of fact, well, and it uh, and that brings us nicely to our our fourth and final part of the paradox. After which we're going to take some questions from you all. So I hope you're thinking up some good questions about these various aspects of the paradox. The last one is the industry paradox. The fact that the vendors love you to death as CIOs, they want to sell to you, but any chance they get, they zip right around you to the business side. Now that we have cloud and cloud services, that's so much easier to do. I've had so many CIOs get up at our events and tell stories about getting a call from the CFO saying, you know, were you aware that, it, why is all this money suddenly shown up on this division's corporate Amex and, and a, a, arrive at work and find out there's a whole new set of business intelligence applications that his marketing group just launched and they, and they have a server on Amazon. And so this stuff can happen and, and uh, you may have some grumbling about, well, policies can prevent that, but we all know that when a business unit is making good money and they're the, the jewel of the CEO's eyes, they can do whatever they like and they will go out and buy their own. And of course, Anne, you used to have hundreds of agencies doing this sort of thing. So as that as that is a paradox, how do you like, from Iron Mountain, you've got a, probably a whole company full of people that think they know how to run IT better than you do. So how do you deal with that, that industry struggle between the vendor relationships and going around you to get to the end customers? Or in fact, should CIOs try to stop that? Or so I think it's on, on two fronts. One is I think it, it, it's really around trust, right? It's trust with your, your business community, mm -hmm. right, and, and the folks that, that you serve uh, to make sure that they have your trust, that you're going to be very open-minded and find the right solutions, whether they be things that are within the standard or not. The other one is to build trust within your vendor community so that, that and again, there's, 
there's not that many of them that you can't keep, keep an eye on them, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I was speaking to a bunch of our um, Iron Mountain uh, sales reps uh, a few months ago talking about selling to the CIO. And what I counseled them was, uh, you know, don't go around the CIO, make him your partner. Make sure you're asking and come in and say, how can I solve your problems? And, and so I think if you do it on two fronts, one is to have trust with your vendors so that they're, they're collaborators with you, and, and more importantly, the trust with your business users. Okay, and James, you must have, I don't know if you have hundreds of them, maybe thousands. Um, how, what is your vendor management approach and where do you think, uh, how does that work out in terms of the paradox about them trying to work around you? Um, you know, I agree, I absolutely agree with Bill that it's about being engaged with the business team so that you're not surprised by these things. If, you're, yeah. if you have a true, you know, partnership with the teams who are trying to move the business along, which is why we're, in, which is why we're there too, you shouldn't be surprised by what the strategies are and what the objectives are and all the different possible scenarios to achieve them. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have any problem with them, with us using whatever the solutions are as long as we've made sure that we understand what it is and the risks and rewards for that. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes when, when people go and, and, and do these things w without the, the help of maybe the technology function, um, you can take some shortcuts and, and, and generate some additional risk in particular mm -hmm. when it comes to cloud services. But, um, you know, it's not a turf war as far as I'm concerned. It's about making sure that we work together to, to get the right, the right solutions. We have several cloud services that we use of different shapes and varieties, but mm -hmm. they really are uh, an integral part of our overall ecosystem right. and uh, make some things easier to do and some things more complicated. Um, as you try to plug these things together. You know, I know you have a there's a session later on on cloud services. I'll be interested to, to listen in. But, you know, cloud services in, in many ways is the next evolution of all of the things that have been out there forever, right? I mean, you know, companies have been plugging into, you know, you know Credit check services for 20 years, right? Sharing, I you think know, I mean, circling all around. So sharing. you know, the services have gotten more elaborate, and and uh, the connection models are, and, and there are new business models around the various different things that are available. But um, you still need to understand how it's going to play as part of your overall ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In my view, a lot of these services become. Um, worthwhile when you can make sure you can populate them with the data that is the lifeblood of your own business. Yes. They're, otherwise, they're pretty hollow and shallow and, and so forth. Right. Well, and, and Anne, you're actually actively encouraging this sort of thing. Uh, talk a little bit about your open data initiative and the iPhone apps that, for instance, you're starting to encourage that, because uh, we, when we were talking about the consumerization of IT and the fact that people really want those iPhone apps, but you don't want to end up responsible for develop, developing them all within government. Yeah, this is a really exciting initiative that we've been able to launch uh, in the Commonwealth, but the, it all started at the White House. The White House launched uh, uh, data.gov, data which is a website where the federal government agencies were mandated by the president to all put public data up on the website so it could be used openly by the taxpayers mm -hmm. who, after all, own the data. Uh, so we were eager to be the first, one of the first states to create a state uh, open data site, and I'm proud to say that we were, and there are only a handful of states that have created uh, these types of open data sites. And what we've done, I believe, beyond other states is our um, Massachusetts Department of Transportation, through their leadership, working with uh, a group here at MIT, held a developers conference. So they openly published uh, data for, on bus schedules and then had a competition for the best iPhone applications to take advantage of that open data. Mm -hmm. And this was way cool and really exciting to be able to see how incredibly entrepreneurial and innovative people outside the state are using the state's data once we've been able to open it up. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're really excited about the potential in uh, developing more open data feeds that citizens, the public, and business can use uh, in unimaginable ways. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, it's a, it's, it is very cool. It's, it's nice to see Massachusetts leading on that as well. That's very exciting. OK, as promised, we're going to open up to some questions. Uh, let's, uh, let's see somebody, some brave soul, come up to the microphone with our first question. <coughs> I'm feeling brave this morning. My name is Linda Pelicudas. I'm with Strategy and Design Solutions. And my question to the panel is this. When you are looking at the sea of projects, can you describe some of the strategies that you've used to help prioritize those projects and then to drive progress within those projects? All right. Very good one. Who wants to jump at that one first? I'll Bill? start. Mm -hmm. um, so we put together a governance process where there is a uh, part of the PMO, the Project Management Office, right, is the, um, the uh, sort of the, the focus on where all that project um, uh, appetite comes to. And then they're able to put that into a process where there is uh, a dialogue with the business around what the expected return on investment is, right? It's all about the dollars and the return, uh, what the scope of the project is, uh, looking at the, the manpower that we have available for the project, where we can fit that in the timeline, and, and, and then the project gets launched based on its merits, and then there's the whole inspection process during the, the project itself, uh, as well as the after inspection to make sure that we're delivering on the results as much as we had. Now, we're like many companies, I think that's the last part to mature, right, is to make sure you go back and say, did it deliver all the business value? But, but it really requires a closed loop uh, system to make sure from inception to delivery and expected results that you've got all those things cataloged. Okay, anyone else want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I'll just mm -hmm. um, say that at this state, we've done pretty much the same thing that Bill described. Fortunately, um, although our operating budgets have been severely cut, the governor and the legislature did pass two years ago a capital bond bill for information technology so that we could invest in some of that deferred, infra deferred maintenance in the infrastructure. So we do have some capital funds that can be used to support major projects. And we likewise have set up a PMO. But it's all tied to our strategic plan. So as the project proposals come in, they're actually self-scored by the secretariat and the agency, depending upon how closely they align with our IT strategic plan, as well as with the goals of their secretariat. And then the senior CIO cabinet reviews how the ranking has come in and decide, we decide together what are the projects that we'll be funding over the next couple of years. And we now have a, a group that oversees the, impl the uh, implementation and how well those projects go over time. Mm -hmm. At, at the federal level, at the Department of Energy, we have an IT capital investment management process where we have a portfolio of, of the major projects across the department. Many of them are in the programs, and the, and the senior program leaders I mentioned, undersecretaries, have a key role in deciding what's important to their programs and what can best support them. For those projects that support central administrative processes, we do that together. It's a partnership between the CFO and the CIO and other leaders in deciding what our priorities should be. You asked uh, also about tracking projects and tracking, tra tracking progress. Uh, uh, for developmental pro pro uh, projects, we use earned value management and a number of other tools uh, and report both internally as well as externally, and, and including up on the web, open government. Uh, at, at the Department of Energy, we were the, we had, when the uh, data.gov was uh, put up to the world, we had the first featured data set on, on data.gov, uh, an energy information data set. So it's openness, it's providing reporting, it's accepting comments, uh, it's partnership with the business leaders, it's partnership between the CIO and the CFO. Second question? No, actually, I'm, I'm going to say no, because <laughs> we have other people in line. But thank you. It was an absolutely great opener. All right. And we're going to come over here. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm Kevin Osborne. I'm a VP of technology at Name Media. I work for a small company. And uh, there, you know, less, you know, doing, doing more with less is, like you say, it, it's, it's, that's it. And, and uh, the, the problem that I often face is that actually we, we're actually pretty successful with doing that. However, we sort of overrun a little bit. So we start delivering business value right away, but then uh, we, we've created prototypes, essentially, that you know, aren't really production ready. And, uh, and so I just wanted to know if the panel could speak a little bit more about how to you know, build justification for building those systems out and how to 
you know, sort of prioritize those things like that. And, and I wonder, too, I've heard some CIOs have been using private cloud structures for a lot of that similar sort of approach. I'll throw this one to James. Sure. Um, I mean, I think it boils down to education and being able to have a dialogue to begin with. So, you know, you have to be able to have a discussion that says, look, we've got this great idea and we can get this thing up and running quickly and you can get some value. But here is the, here is the roadmap, here are the steps from where I am today to where we need to be. And if you drop off after step one, I promise you, you're headed for some problems. We can't support it. It's not going to be scalable. It's not going to be secure or whatever else it is. So it, it, to me, it boils down to education and having that dialogue that you can rely on that uh, they don't jump to the next idea just because you, OK, it's all done. The prototype, plug it in, and, and you're up and done, right? Um, so I think that that's, that, that's, that's how I would answer your question. Relative to the internal cloud, and. Um, um, you know, I'm particularly interested in all the dialogue that, that I hear and read these days about cloud computing. My personal perspective is that certainly for us, the model is to have an internal cloud. We have the, we have the uh, scale that we can build out the c capabilities we need. You know, the kind of um, the byline or the tagline I'm trying to get the, the, my teams to understand is that we need to eliminate the provisioning of our infrastructure um, off of all of our business projects. Yes, you talked about getting so, infrastructure out of the critical pathway right. so you so, don't have to count it in the nine right. months that a project is going to take, for instance. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, And there are many things that will help us do that. The, the automation capabilities, the, the, the sophisticated automation of automatically building out servers, storage, network capabilities are a piece of that. And then there are some process improvements we can also do to make sure that we eliminate the uh, procurement and manufacturing lead times. But our goal is to absolutely eliminate the provisioning mm -hmm. of infrastructure from the delivery of business capability, from the critical path. We obviously, there's a lot of work to be done, but I see no reason why it should be on the critical path. I'd also advise to, to make sure you're designing with the long term in mind, right? So keep in mind, even though you know, you're starting in, in a flexible manner, you know, think about what's the long term sustainability, availability, scalability. And if you design that into the beginning, then you're less apt to run into the problems as the, the project matures. OK, excellent. Thank you. We'll take a question over here. Uh, Matt Hooper from Imperonix. Uh, as a CAO, what I've been trying, challenged with is getting the business to define their services. I think, Bill, you made a comment about a bad process gets you to the wrong solution faster or something like that. And, and it's true, if the business doesn't define their services, it's the tail wagging the dog, right, if you try IT improvements. So what have you been able to do to get the business to, to really commit to defining their services? In, in my company, they're, they're 50 years old. They're in this business transformation because of the economy. Getting them to lock down the services was a nightmare. So they turned to me and said, well, you own it. <laughs> so I don't know if that was, was the right solution. We're running with what we have. But what have you done to get the business to both identify where their services are critical and stable, as we learned earlier, and where are they going? What is that life cycle for those services? So I think I heard the term earlier around sacred transactions on an IT perspective, but I think that also applies to the business, right? So in order, in order to make a business run whatever it is, there are certain business processes that are table stakes in order to provide services. And then there's the innovation part where you're now trying to expand your business into new revenue growth by providing new services. So I would counsel you to, again, uh, it is a mistake to hand the services over to IT, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, there's nothing, uh, nothing going to drive a project to its death sooner than having IT own the project. So I would counsel you to go back and make sure that the business is the owner and aligning your IT strategy with the business strategy. And then what I would do is to make Maybe it's OK, but even still then, even as the marketing officer, I don't believe that's the case. It should be an executive decision for those services and where the market is heading, because you have to know the total resources and capabilities in order to capture market share, right? Yeah, I, so, think, we're, I think we're agreeing, right? So yeah. I'm saying it is, it is a business decision more than it's a technology or an IT decision. So as the chief marketing officer, now you've got the, uh, you know, the leverage now to make sure it is owned by the business, and then to have that drive the IT agenda uh, rather than sort of IT trying to drive the business agenda. Are you using any any frameworks though, like ServQual or anything? Has anybody used that to the business education to get them to define these things? I uh, think I think since we're getting that specific, maybe we should take yeah. this one over lunch. So uh, come up afterwards, and 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 our panelists will talk further. We're going to take a question over here. Hello, my name is Marco Chefa. Um, 
currently looking for work, but uh, <laughs> I have volunteering um, some time for one of the Boston Public Charter Schools, the uh, Young Achievers Math and Science. So the question is going to be more directed to the government sector. Mm -hmm. um, some of the challenges that I've been observing in my volunteer of the IT organization there have been from a technology organization, not only evangelizing, but also teaching one of the big initiatives coming down from the federal government. Um, it's the integration of technology into the business or the day-to-day. -day. I find that from a technology, you give them tools, many people don't know what to do with them or how to use it. So technology seems to transform into more a business enabler and teacher and spokesperson and almost like vendors. So how much of your core strategy is in line with partnership with some of these vendors? Because budget in the government sector is definitely going to be limited. You won't have a lot of your um, capabilities and staff to support doing it all, as, as well as day-to-day -day operations. OK, good question, vendor partnership. Anyone want to jump at that one? Okay, could I jump in? I'm really glad you brought this up. And I, um, I thought that my co-panelists here did a great job indicating I'm, I'm answering this a little bit differently than vendor partnerships, but I'll get to that. Okay. Just what an important part communication is, a part of the CIO job. Uh, I think you you use the term cheerleader, and you talked about your town hall meetings, and we talk about all the stakeholders we constantly have uh, to be communicating with. And I was as I was listening to all of that, I was starting to realize just what a huge part communication plays in the role of the CIO, and it's communication at all levels. And that includes communicating clearly with the vendor community, because they are incredibly important partners of ours. And so um, again, in my world, all things lead back to our strategic plan, because our strategic plan is tied back to what government's mission is. And so we made it very clear to vendors First of all, we're not a territory anymore. We're a single customer, and we're your largest customer. And when you come to talk to us, talk to us about how you can help us advance our strategic plan. And I have to say, the vendor community has been tremendous. They've, they've really, and that's what they want to do. I think it was your mm -hmm. CEO who said C CIOs don't want to be sold to. Mm -hmm. and. They don't want, a lot of these vendors don't want to just come in and sell their boxes or their licenses to us, and they really are coming, understanding our strategic direction and our strategic plan, and they're genuinely becoming part of the solution. But that's just one slice of this, all the communications we have to do. We have to communicate as well with our users and with, uh, with um, executives. It, it is, it's a very relationship-based job, mm -hmm. and most relationships mm -hmm. have communication in there somewhere. Uh, yeah. In fact, usually a very big important thing. Of course, as an editor, this is a big hobby horse of mine, is that the communication, we talk, uh, we've talked a lot in IT about aligning with business, and I've been going around calling that the scarlet A, the alignment word. I think it's time we quit talking about aligning as though we were a separate part of business and talk more about acceleration. That's my favorite A. Oh, that's oh well, thank you. Thank you very much. My, one of my new hobby horses, CIOs have been loving it. That and career is opportunity. I want everybody to remember that one. All right, we're going to take a question over here. Thank you. Very good question. Yes, my name is Gabino Roche. I'm with the New York Stock Exchange Euronext, and I work at a new division, two years old, called uh, NYSC Technologies. So um, the New York Stock Exchange is trying to become more of a technology company, and we acquired several startup companies, and so we're going through some growing pains of getting that division started up. Um, one of our main problems is you guys have talked about uh, having trust with the business, and I, I'm in total agreement with that, and I think we have that. It's just that, that that doesn't always give us the transparency and the understanding of the business value for the projects that we're pursuing. So I'm working with the CIO and some of the, uh, the executives to try to institute maybe some type of governance, um, but I don't want the business to feel that we're creating bureaucracy and trying to stop them. Now, with a new vision like ours, brand new greenfield projects, that, uh, products that we're selling, out to the financial institutions, you know, delivery is very important. And with limited resources and time, we got to figure out where is, um, what, what projects have the, or uh, products have the most value. So I'm curious from your experiences, if you could share with me a way that you could, uh, that you've in your past negotiated with the business, earning their trust, but convincing them that the value is important to understand so that y you can equally, uh, I guess, 
uh, diplomatically talked between all the different business unit managers so that you know which projects you need to put your resources on. Keeping your stakeholders happy. And I will, um, great question, and I have to caution everyone, believe it or not, we're at the two minute and counting down mark. We are not gonna be able to take any more questions after this one, and I will ask my panelists to be brief and very succinct in answering that one. And I'll start with James. You've dodged the last couple of questions. You've been getting away with things over there. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, I, I think it gets back to, you know, are you at the point where they believe that they can have an open discussion with you about all the aspects of the project? Have you proven that you can execute yet? So have you earned the trust is, is the key thing. And um, you, you'll do that by execution. It won't be because you come across, you know, what was it, the, the, the old adage, they, they don't care how much you know until they know, you know how much you care or whatever. <laughs> Uh, the, the, I think that's where, where it's going to be. You, you're going to have to, that's going to take a while. You're going to have to continue to work at it and uh, participate in the business discussions, make sure they understand that you have a perspective on the outcome because oftentimes they'll say, well, this is just the technology guy. He doesn't understand, you know, the ROI that I'm trying to generate or all the other aspects of the capability that are going to be an input to that because it's likely not just a technology project to begin with anyway, right? Okay, excellent. Tom? bring the business unit leaders and their people in at the very early stage so that they're really partners with you in presenting new ideas and presenting for the use of IT or, or, or for expansion or for, for introducing cloud computing or social networking, whatever the new approach is. Involve them early on, involve them in pilots. Where possible, involve more than one business, senior business leader in a joint project, which uh, gets a little bit of uh, 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 into the issue of uh, internecine warfare among the business units and <laughs> helping them to work together, work together toward a common goal. This idea of communicating and putting together pilots also works in an educational uh, setting too. I, I have some experience in, in, in doing that where you involve the teachers, you involve the educational administrators in the process um, uh, early on so that they in part are part of the creators. And this is not renaming something and not calling it IT, although that's not a bad idea either in some cases, but it's really having them as partners from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Bill? Uh, the first one's the hardest, right? The, for the first time you, you, to, to convince the business the hardest, what, what they have to realize and, and you have to convince them is that the process is not the antithesis of, of agility, it's really an accelerator. And, and once you get and you demonstrate that through some, some successful projects, uh, they'll come back every time we want to do it the right way. Okay, and we will give the last word of the day to the Commonwealth, and Oh, thank you. I don't think I can add to what's been said. Okay. I, I think they captured it so well. It... Giving IT direction, you know, and having a strategy. Um, I think, you know, before with all these different business units, they had their own fiefdoms, but as we're evolving, um, that strategy could help, you know, along with the, the governance. So I think that that piece definitely could. Thank you. And that, that, in fact, is probably a great conversation to be having over lunch. Thank you for a very meeting last, meaty last question. And please thank this panel for all the hard work they've done up here.